Made of America, brought to you by DuPont, makers of chemic soaps that take you from the storm-tossed sea to the smoke and flames of a burning skyscraper in order to illustrate the fortitude and quiet courage of American wives and mothers. Just as this wide variation of scene is appropriate to the story, so also is it appropriate to the history of chemical research, which contributes to so many kinds of occupations and to the happier and fuller life of so many people, whether they be on farms or in cities, on land or at sea. Marching in the cavalcade of America, chemists of DuPont and other American companies have played a proud part in striving constantly for the goal set forth in the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra brings us a special arrangement of two well-known songs by the American composer Charles Wakefield Cadman, At Dawning and I Hear a Thrush at Eve.
as the American cavalcade sweeps by, along the line of march, watching and waiting patiently, are the women whose courage and devotion make possible the advancement of our race. Wherever men go out to wrestle a livelihood from the jealous elements, women wait at home for their safe return. The wild seas that beat against our shores are the scene of an industry from which we realize vast sums of money every year. In 1870, the center of our fishing industry is at Gloucester on Cape Ann in Massachusetts. A young girl from Indiana engaged to be married to a young Gloucester fisherman is talking with his mother. Oh, if they don't stop that terrible horn, I'll go out of my mind. Huh? Oh, that. <laughs> he gets used to it. So will you. I don't think so. I was raised inland. Anyway, the fall of the lift by my. Been going all day. And all last night. Is it always like this in April? Most any month east of Cape Ann. The wind will spring up after a while and blow it away. Well, the sun will burn through it. We have nothing like this in Indiana. Just as dry as all that. Oh, well, we have ground mist sometimes after sunset and a haze in the morning now and then. But we don't go roaring and bellowing and ringing bells until it lifts. You don't have wrecks. The sea is terrible. Well, we make our living out of it here in Gloucester. And I guess you've had our cod and mackerel out where you come from, too. I expect we have. But I didn't think of John as going out in the boat. My son will be master of the best of them one day, like his father and his grandfather, on both sides before him. We're all seafaring folks around Gloucester. It must be mighty strange to be married to a fisherman. Well, my father came in every night from the fields ever since I could remember. Why, it would seem like, well, like being a widow, not having your man come home for weeks at a time. We're raised to it. You'll get used to it. After we're married, I'll make John give up going to sea. Not if you're wise, you want. It's in his blood. It's the very breath of life to him. But his father, your husband, Jane, and your own father, what became of them? John's father was in a lost dory on the Grand Bank. A lost dory? When the men get the fishing ground, sometimes they put out in dories. Small robots they are. Two boats, two to a boat. The cast in the nets are fishing with hand lines. If a fog or a gale comes up sudden-like, well, horrible. And your own father? He went on the rock out yonder before they put the light there. But that's as long ago. Well, I won't live waiting and waiting like that, always suspecting the worst. Then don't marry John. But I love him. I will. So do I. Of course. You're his mother's. But I don't understand why well, you let him... Well, Ruth, your own father got caught in a gale right in his own farm. The cyclone, we call it out there. But at least it was quick. And Mother was with him. He'd have done better staying down cellar with you. Not that I'm sorry you came to live with us. You know better than that. Oh, of course, Jane. Why? What's that? What? I thought I heard something. It's the silence. The horn stopped. The fog must be lifting. Oh. The wind will be shifting now. Maybe it'll be a good breeze. Oh, oh, oh. I knew it. Bury him in the kitchen. Oh, so sent me after his duffel. When's he going? Right away. The fog lifted and a fresh breeze is coming out of the southwest. Hurry, Ma. Here. Here, Ruth, put the new bread in that oilskin bag. Yes. Barry, get your brother's boot. All right. I'll get a few extras together. Well, I'll do that, Jane, while you pack his clothes. Oh, most of his duffel's been packed and ready this last two weeks, waiting for good weather. Hurry with the bread, Ruth. Here's his boots, Ma. Good. Now, take this bundle. Ma. What? Can I go with him? No, you're too young. I'm 14. Dad went when he was only 14. No, I need you here. Now, take these things down to your brother. And be sure you come back. Oh, gee, Ma. Wish him good luck for me. And mind you come back. Oh, I'll come back, all right. Ruth, maybe you'll better go along to make sure he does. I can't get about so fast anymore. The way he looked, well... Is John really meaning to go to sea without coming up to say goodbye? Oh, maybe he can't waste time with such nonsense. The wind's right for a quick run to the Grand Banks, and every fisherman will be pulling his muscles out, trying to make two trips before the bad weather sits in again. He wouldn't risk losing half a year's catch just for a kiss. But not even a word? Nothing? Nonsense. 
Barry was just too excited to think of it. If John did catch his breath long enough to tell him. Ruth, maybe you'd better go after Barry, just to be sure. I'd rather not. But if you insist, Jane... Never mind. It's too late. That bell means the first bus cast and off. I wonder if it's the dolphin. Well, not that it matters much. John can outsail them all anyway. Just the same. Go up to the top of the house and see if he's cleared the breakwater yet. I'd rather not. Oh, you won't fall off. There's a railing round the roof. You're safe enough up there. It's called a widow's walk. I don't have a mind to be that kind of a widow. Why, girl, if John makes two trips this season, he'll have enough to set you up fine when you're married. I'm not going to marry him. What? But you... I won't be a fisherman's wife. I won't marry a man who can't even think enough to say goodbye. Why, he might never come back again. And I... I don't know as I care whether he does or not. <laughs> I see. But whether you care or not, now I'm sure you wouldn't make John a good wife. Put on the kittle. I'm going up to the widow's wall alone. <laughs> An hour later, Jane comes down from the widow's walk to begin her patient vigil till her ship, John Schooner Dolphin, comes home again, if the Lord in his mercy will have it so. Oh, well, you startled me. You're easy frightened. I've been thinking, Jane. I'm terribly ashamed for the way I behave. I love John so much, it hurts so to think. Oh, I understand, Ruth. Never mind. They're all hull down on the horizon now. Just put the kettle on. Let's have a dish of tea. You said it's chill. All right, Jane. Where's Barry? Barry? Why, I don't know. I haven't seen him since... Barry! Hand me my shawl, Ruth. Come in. Jane. Jane, what are you thinking of? Are you plumb daft? Sit down, please. How can you keep cool? Well, maybe you don't know. No, what? That your boy, Barry, has gone out with the dolphin. Barry's gone? Hey, yeah. And him only a boy. Jane, I wonder, after all you've been through, you wouldn't keep one of your boys from the sea. I knew he'd go. I felt... Oh, Jane, forgive me. It's all my fault. No, he'd have gone sooner or later. Only I... He just oh. jumped on board as they were shoving off. He'll be out there on those awful banks. Maybe out on the sea in one of those little dories. Of course he'll be in a dory, if he's any son of mine. Out on the storm-tossed, wind-driven sea, the fishing schooner Dolphin thrashes about in the teeth of a gale. Take in the force! Stay still! John! John! The Bob State's parting in the Fort Cummins is going to fall! Barry! Barry, get back out of that! Go below! Stand clear! same storm roars along the coast of Cape Ann, tearing at the snug, tight little white cottage on the hill in Gloucester. Oh, will it never stop? Hour after hour, it's just been going on. And out there somewhere... Oh, Jane, nothing could live through this. John, John. You'd better go fasten that shutter before it tears loose from its hinges. What? Oh, shutter, I scarcely heard it. You must be deep. How can you even think of such a thing? Don't you realize John is out there with... Yes, and Barry. I think I'll bake a cake. I don't understand you, Jane. You seem so hard sometimes. You don't seem to care at all. Care? With my two boys out there, all I've got left in the world, the years I've waited for the sea to send me back the men I love, my father, my husband, and now my Son. Oh, Jane, I know. I'm so frightened. Forgive me, please. I'll try to be more brave. Get me the flour. Will the cake be chocolate or coconut? Barry likes chocolate, this. Oh, my boy, my baby. <laughs>
days pass into weeks without a word from the fishing fleet that had put to sea so confidently with the dolphin. April blossoms into May. Ruth has learned to wait as bravely and as patiently as Jane. Then, late one evening, as the sun is sinking in the west... The bell. What are they ringing the church bell for? They sighted one of the ships back from the banks. Come up to the top of the house. We'll see there. Bring along that glass. Glass? The spyglass woman. Oh, I can't get up like I used to. Once I did it, two at a time. Watch the turn of the steps, Jane. Yeah, I will. Do you think it can be the dolphin? Oh, well, whatever, but it is. The first back since the storm, they'll have news. Be careful your head coming through the trap door. Oh, what a beautiful evening. So clear and fresh. Don't slam the door. Here, help me steady this glass. There. That's it. Uh, what is it? It's the dolphin, all right. Without her four topmasts. But, Jane, how can you tell which boat it is from here? Why, it's scarce. Don't you think we know our own vessels? But they can't see you. Oh, yes, there he is. In the bow. Waving his hat. John? No, Barry. What would John be doing in the bow, you landlubber? He'd be at the wheel. But oh, they can't quite... Yes, they can. There's John, too. Oh, oh Jane, Jane, I'm so glad I'm going to have to cry. Go below, Ruth, and put the cake in the oven. And leave you here alone? I want to be alone. I'm going to pray. As the fishermen risk their lives in a struggle against the primeval elements of air and water, so our firemen and policemen are ever struggling against the dread element, fire. Our second episode in the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, tells the story of the wives who wait for these brave men on whose quick thinking and prompt action may depend the security of life and property. Early in the morning of January 9, 1912, Company Lieutenant John Larkin of the New York Fire Department is called from home when his private alarm signal summons him to duty. He leaves his wife, Mary, and their daughter, Molly, busy in the kitchen getting breakfast. I wonder where the fire is, Mom. Station 24, your pa said it was. Well, another false alarm, maybe. Not on a second alarm, Molly. It's a real fire, all right. Come in. Oh, excuse me, busting in like a wild wind, Mary. Oh, come right on in, Bridget. Have some breakfast. Oh, thank you kindly. I haven't had a bite yet this morning. Fry Mrs. Riley an egg, Molly, and make some tea. Yes, Mom. I could be using a cup of tea. It's a bit of cold outside. The temperature's below zero. You don't say. Well, what brings you out so early, then? Well, my Danny hasn't come home from his beat yet. Huh? He's been transferred to night work in the financial district. Not that he likes night work, but it's nearer home. Yeah. I... I was wondering what would be keeping him on a bad, windy morning, Mary. Would you be knowing of anything? Well, there's a fire at Station 24. Oh, glory be, that's on his beat. Well, now I... Oh. Here goes the third alarm. Oh, it must be getting serious then. 24 isn't far from here. I I think I'll run over and see how bad it is. I'll go along with you, Mary. Yeah, me too, Mom. No, Molly, you stay here. Keep the kettle boiling. Get some blankets off the beds and warm them up behind the stove, just in case. Yes, Mom. Now, where'd I put my hat? Oh, here, and... Molly, put the bread in the oven. Yes, Mom. Come on, Bridget. You better take this shawl. You may need it. Thanks, I will. The wind's howling a gale. After you, Bridget. Oh, it is cold out. Wind goes right through you. Don't it, though? Oh, Mary, it is over on Danny's beat, all right. Be hard to keep a fire checked in this weather. The water'll turn to ice. And if it gets headway... Look out! Oh! Did you see that engine skid the corner? Oh, now. hurry. We must be getting close. I can hear the pump. Well, there's holes all along the street already, and no oh, it's around the corner, maybe. Watch you don't slip on the ice, Mary. Look! There! Mother of mercy. It's the X 
equitable building. Oh, my Danny will be right in the thick of it. Oh. Hurry. Here, you two. Where do you think you're going? My husband's fire, Lieutenant Larkin, and I thought this... Well, he's busy just now, as you might imagine. Have you seen my Danny? Sure. Danny Riley? Sure. He was on the other side of the building the last I saw him. Nor tell him where he is now. But you can't go past the fire line. They've sent out a fifth alarm. They'll be laying new lines through here at any minute. Stand back in the doorway. You'll be all out of the blame wind. Thank you kindly. Look, Mary. It's like the fiery pit. Oh, it's awful. Take care that none of the spray falls on you. It'll freeze you stiff. Oh, it's blowing the streams of water right into mist before it even touches the building. And with all that pressure... There's a 60-mile gale blowing, lady. Just look at the engine, all covered with ice. Why, you can hardly... Look lively there. Get back in the doorway, lady. Oh, it's a wonder them walls can stand all that heat and ice. They can't. Look, part of the cornice is falling. Oh, there it is. Oh, oh. It's exploding like bombs. And it's made of solid granite. Oh, the heat must be terrible. Look, Mary, up there on the roof. There's three men. Oh, they're trapped. Maybe it's John. No, no, there's some of the cleaners and porters who were working in the building. They wouldn't clear out trying to save stuff. No, they'd be lucky if they can save themselves. Well, won't somebody even be trying? Sure, and more lives lost just because they wouldn't obey the chief's orders. There goes the hook and ladder. They're moving it under him. Oh, it'll never reach. The roof's up eight stories. They'll climb the ladder far as they can. Then they'll use scaling ladders. You know, that height? Sure, ma'am. But how'll they get over the wide corners? Oh, they'll find a way somehow. Oh, they shoot a line over from one another building. The street here ain't very wide. Yeah, but if the wall falls... Yes, it'll fall all right sooner or later. Oh, look at those rocks fly off them. Yeah. The heat must be something fierce inside. Oh. Nothing but cast iron columns holding it up. Oh, and I think that John in there, and me here, unable to do a thing. Oh, Mrs. Larkin. Mrs. Larkin, is that you? Yes, Tim. I just seen the lieutenant. Well, he's over by that ladder somewhere. Oh, it makes me feel so helpless. I can only do something. Say, you, you really could do something if you would. What? See if you can get us some coffee. Some of our men have been hurt, and we're all half frozen. Why, of course. Mary, look. Look, going up that ladder, three of them. And one... Of Bridget. The first one looks like John. Oh, Mary, you can't leave now. I, I'll get the coffee. Now, Bridget, there's no use standing here wondering. John has his work. Thank heaven I have something to do now besides waiting. Those men will need a hot drink when they come down. Oh, I'm praying they do come down. Well, we'll be more used to them getting the coffee than standing here eating our hearts out with fear. We won't be long. <laughs> While the fire rages and her husband's lives are in peril, Mary and Bridget make buckets of coffee with the water Molly has kept boiling at home. Then all three of them struggle back through the sub-zero gale to find the equitable building a roaring inferno of flames. What was that, Mom? We'll soon see. Don't spill the coffee. Oh, my arms here broke with the weight of these two kettles. Around this corner now, and we can turn them over to the men. See, everything's covered with ice, solid. Look at that engine. Watch out, Molly. You don't slip. Here, you woman. You can't go through here. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's you back again. Oh, that's fine. Hey, fireman. Here's your coffee. Coming right over. Oh, 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 oh say, Mrs. Larkin, this is great. Well, we'll go back and get some more when you've used this up. Well, we don't know how to thank you, Mrs. Larkin. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Coffee. Oh, oh, the worst fire I've ever known. Yeah. There's three men trapped in the great vaults in the basement. Oh. You can see their faces looking out through the bars. Oh, can't you do anything? Well, they're trying to saw through the bars now. Hey, Bill! Yeah. Bill, coffee! Tim. Tim, where's John? The last time I saw the lieutenant, he was banking for the ladders. There's a couple of men caught on the roof, and he volunteered to get them down. Oh, then it was him, I saw. Mary! Mary, look! Oh, no! Oh, no! Gone before the firemen reached them. The firemen, there's, there's no one on the ladder. No, ma'am, but... Oh, but look. Look there. Oh, bloody be. Hanging on, there's the scaling ladder. On the side of the building. It's hooked, held on the remainder wall. Oh, Lord, the big ladder's back now. Sure he'll make it. Oh, thank God. Tim, who's that on the stretcher? Italian Chief Walsh. He was hit by a piece of the wall. Oh. When the wall falls, someone's bound to get hurt. Look, Mary, look. Look, there's John. He's oh. almost on the big ladder. Good. Oh, Good. This way, Lieutenant. Lieutenant, here, here's some hot coffee for you. Oh, that sounds fine. John, 
John. Mary, Molly, why, what are you doing here? Oh, Dad, I'm so glad you're safe. I, I was in love. Oh, Dad, you got icicles oh. all over you. Oh, John. John, have you seen my Danny? Yes, sure. He's over reviving the man they finally saved out of the vault. Oh, thank heaven. Now i got to be getting back. Oh, no, John. Oh, it's all right now, Mary. No more danger. The fire's under control. We've won. <laughs> Against tremendous odds of cold, exploding granite, a gale and freezing spray from 12 million gallons of water, the firemen, under Chief John Kenlon, confined the loss to the equitable building itself and saved the entire financial district from almost certain destruction at minimum loss of life. These are the noble men and women who, for our common welfare, ride a fast and dangerous course in the cavalcade of America. As we have heard this evening in these stories of courageous, steadfast women, many people devote their lives to service of an inconspicuous sort. Since they never make the headlines, it is a privilege to honor them. Such inconspicuous but nevertheless important service is rendered by science, by men and women of science, and by many products of science. This is illustrated by a chemical product that has played a role in some adventures of modern exploration. Most of the metal equipment of a recent polar expedition, motor parts, tools, and everything of the sort, was cadmium-plated. And what you may ask is cadmium. Well, although the name may have a vaguely familiar sound to many of us, it isn't likely that many people know much about cadmium. I know I didn't. It is one of the rarer metals, and when used, as I've just described, is similar in appearance to chromium plating, though usually not so bright. But it is superior to chromium for this purpose because it sticks on the job more securely and has greater resistance to damage from bumps and bangs. Also, it can be applied more easily. There's an interesting point about this use of cadmium plating on iron. Usually, we think of iron as being a symbol of strength, and of course, it is strong in many ways, but it has one weak point. It's easily attacked by nature. It rusts and wastes away. Various things are done to protect iron from nature, and cadmium plating is one of the best defenses that chemists have devised. One of the many jobs that DuPont chemists do for industry is to extract cadmium from its raw materials and supply this metal for use in plating as an armor for iron. This is just one more instance of the part played by DuPont in creating better things for better living through chemistry. <laughs> Conservation, which tells the curious and interesting story of Johnny Appleseed and an exciting story of forest rangers will be heard next week at this same time when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. W.A.B.C., New York.